Amen. All right. You can have a seat. Take your Bible open to Ephesians chapter 3 real quick, and then I'm going to get right into the book of Revelation. Now that she asked about this question, how'd your service go? Good. Appreciate you letting me in on it. Okay, Chief. No problem. I know you don't answer nobody, Chief. Go good? Good, man. Ephesians chapter number 3. Now, sister, this is to answer your question about, you don't have to get up. This is a, this is a Bible question and answer. I'll let you get up in a second when we read Revelation. All right, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter number three. Now, this thing, this is an important thing for you to get, and it'll actually tie in with what we're doing as far as the book of Revelation. The, the, the misconception is, is that the idea of the church has always been around. Where people get messed up about the gospel, there's the mystery of the indwelling Christ, the church, and there's a mystery, there's seven of the mysteries. I guess I'll have to teach those again. I haven't been through them in about a year or so, but there's seven mysteries. He says that a faithful steward is, is a good steward of the seven mysteries. So I have to teach you the seven mysteries again. But one of them is, is the body of Christ as the church. Nobody got that until the Apostle Paul. Nobody saw it in the Old Testament. No prophet ever preached about it. No prophet ever taught about it. Nobody, including the Lord himself, didn't do it until it was revealed to the Apostle Paul. So this thing called the church age was non-existent until the Lord revealed it to Paul. That's after the Jew rejected God in the Old Testament. He rejected Jesus Christ on Calvary and rejected the Holy Ghost, Acts chapter number 7. And then Acts chapter number 9, he called the Apostle Paul, the Apostle to the Gentiles, and he revealed to Paul the mystery of the church. And so you pick that up in Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 1. For this cause I, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given unto me, you were given to Paul to go to the Gentiles. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, and, or as, it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and the prophets, answer your question, by the Spirit. But nobody got it up until the apostle Paul. What is the mystery? Here it is, verse number 6. Here's the mystery of verse number 3. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Now, what gospel would that be? That would be the gospel of the grace of God, and that's the gospel you get that's called what you said, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it's... Im I'm sorry? Yes, ma'am. That, that'll fit. So, so, I lost my train of thought there. So, so the gospel would be Paul's gospel. That's the death, the burial, and resurrection. That's 1 Corinthians 15. Now, here's, here's important for you to understand the division. If you give me just a second here, I help you to understand this. The apostle Peter comes along and he preaches in Acts chapter number 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized. How do you reconcile that with Paul preaching the death and the burial and the resurrection? Because Peter did not know what Paul knew. It was never revealed to anybody until it was revealed to Paul. So the definitive marker for you in this age is, the reason our gospel is different is, is because Paul, one, is the apostle to the Gentiles, and two, Paul is the receiver of that mystery. And nobody understood it until the apostle Paul understood it. Therefore, you go by what the apostle Paul gets. All right, turn to the book of Revelation. I hope that answers it and that... Uh, I'll go over all seven of those later on. Um, Revelation. Now, we get started in the book of Revelation, and you get started into a whole bunch of things here, and the setup is probably the most important thing for you to get, and it may take uh, two or three messages to get this set up. You can't come to the book of Revelation and read the church, the church, the church, the church, the church, the church into everything. 
The churches are mentioned in Revelations 1 to 4 or Revelation 1 to 3, and then after that, Revelation 4, John's caught up, and after that, no church is mentioned until we come riding back at the end of Revelation 19. That must mean we're somewhere else. I've got seven or eight reasons here if we have time tonight that I'll show you that the church is not going to go through the tribulation. Well, why is that important for me to know, preacher? Can I just tell you? Because a lot of Baptist preachers now, they are jumping ship, and what they're starting to say now is, is, well, I know what I've always taught, but I see now clearly that the church is going to go through the tribulation. Paul said you'll have tribulation, but you ain't going to go through the tribulation. But if you don't get the raptures in the right place, meaning the rapture of the church and the rapture of the tribulation saints, if you don't get those things in the right place, you start crossing all those scriptures together, you can't tell which way's up. There's certain things in the Bible that you can't mess around with, and one of them is the book of Revelation. You've got to rightly divide it. The, Revela the book of Revelation is strongly Jewish. Uh, the Gospels are strongly Jewish. Acts is strongly Jewish. Hebrews is strongly Jewish. But when you come to Revelation, there's more Old Testament references in the book of Revelation than there is any other book in the New Testament. Why? Because Revelation is written to people that are going to be here during the Great Tribulation. It's stuff going on down here on earth while you're up there at the judgment seat of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. You ever look at how your Bible's laid out? I'll let you sit in just a second. The book of Esther is up there. What is that? Well, that's the queen being accepted into the king's palace and they have a marriage supper up there, a feast. And then what happens after that? You have Job that comes along. Oh, what's Job? Tribulation. Who is that? That's a Jew. 42 months in the tribulation. And what happens to that? Psalm, second coming of Christ. It's laid out that way in your Bible. It's premillennial. It's pre-tribulation. That means the church goes out, the bride of Christ goes out before the great tribulation takes place, before the devil takes his throne and does all the things that are going on that they're talking about now that's happening. The, ho the horses of the apocalypse are already riding and, and there's famine and peril and all this stuff happening and the mark of the beast is right around the corner and we're all going to go into tribulation. Help yourself, not me. Doesn't mean you're not going to have tribulation, but you're not going to go in the tribulation the time of Daniel's 70th week, that, the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, notice here, Revelation chapter number 1, the Bible says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, uh, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the th uh, things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified, notice signified, and signified. Who requires a sign? And signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ, of all the things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and that they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Now, Father, we come before this book and we realize the seriousness of what it is we're about to undertake, and we'd ask God for unction from the Holy Ghost. We'd ask that you might clear out the clutter in our minds and our hearts and give us the ability to teach, Lord, and to be able to preach these things, that it might be a blessing to the people that are here tonight. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, one of the things that you need to understand is, is the way that this, uh, this thing ends. The, the, book of the, 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 the book of the Revelation ends in the second coming of Christ, not the rapture. Do you understand the difference? The second coming of Christ is when Jesus Christ comes in Revelation 19 with his saints, and you come down through the universe, and you come down to fight the battle of Armageddon. The rapture of the church is when Jesus Christ comes down and he stops in the clouds and he calls us up to meet him. You say, it's all one and the same thing. No, I'll show you. It probably won't be tonight, but I'll show you that your rapture is not the only rapture that takes place. If you don't put those raptures in the right place and you read the scriptures that have to do with the tribulation saints being raptured out or those taken out right at the very end, you know what will happen? You'll get the whole thing going to where you've got the church in the great tribulation period. You'll start looking for the Antichrist and the second coming of Christ and the tribulation instead of Jesus Christ at the rapture. You're looking for your blessed hope and glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But here's a division for you. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman if not to be ashamed, doing what? Rightly dividing. What do I have to rightly divide? I've got to rightly divide the difference in the second coming and the rapture. Otherwise, my whole doctrine gets messed up. 
I have to understand clearly that the second coming is for those people that are here during the time of the Great Tribulation. I'm not looking for the second coming. I'm looking for the rapture of the church. I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm not looking for tribulation. I'm not looking for the things listed in Matthew chapter 24. Those are signs for the second coming. I'm looking for the rapture. What are the signs for the, set for the rapture? The signs for the rapture are listed in 2 Timothy chapter 3. We've been going over them for a couple of months now. The falling away, the apostasy in the church, the, the problems with Laodicea, that's what you got going on. You look to the church to see how close you are to the rapture. You say what happens in the last days, many people depart from the faith and many people leave. They're still saved. So the, the tribulation period ends in a time of judgment where Jesus Christ comes and fights the battle of Armageddon. All right, side note there, and I'll explain this as we go through the book of Revelation. Uh, there's a battle of Gog and Magog, which many people are saying is the same as the battle of Armageddon. Well, can I ask you a question? If the Holy Spirit wrote that Bible, he's probably the sm smartest being that's ever been anywhere in the entire universe. Would you agree with that? Do you think he knows the difference when he pins Battle of Gog and Magog and he pins Battle of Armageddon? Do you think he knows the difference when he puts down the Valley of Megiddo, which is where the Battle of Armageddon will be fought, and the other thing which has to do with Meshach and Tubal and Pabulsk and all that other stuff? Do you think he knows the difference in the two? Why, sure he knows the difference Amen. in the two. They're not the same thing. Amen. But if you don't rightly divide it, what you start looking for is Russia is going to invade Israel, and that's the Battle of Gog and Magog, and that's going to be Armageddon. Armageddon doesn't take place, and it ain't going to take place. I don't care if the Jew flings a nuclear bomb over there and hits Iran, and then China bombs and Russia bombs. It is not Armageddon. You say, why? Because I'm still here. Armageddon takes place after the rapture takes place, after the judgment seat of Christ, after the marriage supper of the Lamb, after you get the white robe, after you get the crown, and after Jesus Christ comes down here and is on this earth, then the battle of Armageddon takes place, the judgment of nations, the setting up of a millennial kingdom. You've got to rightly divide your Bible. Otherwise, somebody would convince you, we're headed for Armageddon. We're headed for Armageddon. I'm thinking, well, man, if they know that, we must be getting raptured out of here pretty soon. If the rapture to happen right now, you've got to go through all the great tribulation. You've got to go to the judgment seat of Christ. You've got to have all the other stuff. While they're down here on the earth, they're going through great tribulation. What are we doing? We're at the judgment seat of Christ. We're up there in our new body, and we're clothed up there with white robes, and we're up there in front of Jesus Christ. And then we have the marriage supper of the Lamb, get our horses and get ready to come down. That's all taking place before Armageddon ever takes place. So all these people that are sounding the alarm and talking to you about the time of the apocalypse, the time of the apocalypse, that's just a fancy word to make you think that they know more than they do. The Lord wrote through the power of the Holy Spirit, Revelation. You say, why? Because you can understand Revelation. You have to understand something fancy to understand apocalypse. What's Revelation? It just means simply revealed. But you're not going to get it revealed to you if you don't study to show yourself approved. You have to be willing to be a servant. Isn't that what he says there in verse number 1? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show his servant. So I guess it's kind of conditional. The revelation would be you'd have to be saved, first of all. You'd have to be not carnal, second of all. And you'd have to be a willing servant, third of all. All right, look how the church age in. The Pauline uh, uh, things, you know what happens? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter number 3, he says in other ages, like the sister was talking about, in other ages, it's not made known to the sons of men. The mystery of the church, it's kept secret, Romans 16, since the world began. Nobody knew about the church age. So the things in the book of Revelation are not written to the church. You can get some things for the church, but doctrinally is not to the church. Uh, Ephesians chapter number 3, from the beginning of the world, God hath kept them hidden in himself. In Colossians chapter number 1, they've been hidden from the ages, from generations, but now is made manifest only to who? His saints. Now look at the difference in the ending. Look in 1 Timothy chapter number 3. How does this thing end for the church? Let's get this down pat first before we go any further. It's so critical that you get the, the way Revelation is divided up and if you don't get it right, you'll mess up the rest of your Bible. Revelation is the key to understanding Genesis. Genesis is the key to understanding Revelation. If you don't get the way the thing is laid down and the way things are, are divided up in the Bible, you'll start trying to put that stuff down on yourself. Historically, some of these things have taken place. Let me clarify this. I don't know if you have an old Schofield Bible or not. He's pretty close. I think he writes 90 A.D. in the book of Revelation there. But what most of your commentators try to do, including independent fundamental Baptists, they try to make the time of the writing of the book of Revelation somewhere before 70 A.D. Have you ever wondered why? 
Because Revelation 17 and 18, if you've ever read it, you can't miss Rome in there unless you're not looking for Rome. Right. The colors and the woman and everything there, it's called the whore of Revelation. That is still and will remain the Roman Catholic Church. You say, you can't be saying stuff like that. Well, you can't say that, but I can say that because that's what it is. What the commentators by education want to say is, is, well, what they want you to do. You say, well, what's the big difference of when it was written? Well, it's real important for this reason. If it was written prior to 70 A.D., that would mean that when Titus invaded Jerusalem in 70 A.D. and sacrificed a pig on the altar and all that, that we can say Titus, who was a representative of Rome, and that was pagan Rome, and so therefore everything that's taken place here written in the book of Revelation has to do with pagan Rome. But, oh, we're not that way anymore. Uh, we're not pagan Rome. We're papal Rome, and we've all changed now because, see, that's all historical. First of all, it's not historical. It's prophetical. That means it is yet to take place. There's nothing in the book of Revelation that I will talk to you about over the next several months or years or however long it takes to get through it. There's nothing that has taken place yet. When it gets past Revelation chapter 4 all the way to Revelation 22, every bit of that is to come in the future. There's a few things in Revelations 1 to 3 that have taken place, and I'll show you that as we go through it. Secondly, why would they be interested in doing that unless they don't want you to know who it is that fits Revelation 17 and 18? You say, so you're saying your religion is right and everybody else is wrong. Not my religion, but my Savior's right. Amen. One mediator between God and man, who? The man Christ Jesus, not Mary. Everybody wants to preach to you about the Muslims, but the Muslims aren't mentioned in Revelation 17 and 18. You see, you're getting uncomfortable already because you want to get in the book of Revelation, but you can't get in the book of Revelation without calling a spade a spade and without getting serious, and you can't cut no corners in there and be touchy-feely about this stuff. This is stuff that's going to take place when the devil himself is down here, but who wants to believe that? Let's all be warm and fuzzy and friendly. The time is being set up where papal Rome is going to take over and going to rule and reign, and all that stuff is going to take place, and they're going to be a big part of the Great Tribulation because the devil is going to have a bride and that will be the Roman Catholic Church the same way the Lord has a bride which is the church the same way God has a bride which is Israel but that's why people don't want you to talk about Revelation you say why because Revelation chapter number 20 take the time to read it if you can stomach it you'll have to have a barf bag by your bed with your cup of coffee there because Revelation 20 you know what he says he says I'm done with a whole lot of you I'm finished with the whole deal I'm pulling every one of you together to cast every one of you out and the ones that deserve to go to hell to go to hell I'm going to burn the whole cotton picking mess up but who wants to read that Preacher, you know, we're getting better and we're getting more positive and look at the events that we're doing. Look at the things we've created and oh, we're becoming better mankind and we're solving the problems of mankind. Yeah, how's that working out for you? If the Bible's right, every time man gets involved in something, he always ends up in a mess. You ever look how Adam ended? He ended up in a mess. You ever look at how Noah ended? He ended up in a mess. You ever look how Moses ended? He ended up in a mess. Jesus Christ came to try to pull you out of that mess. You crucified him. He hands it over to the church. You ever look how it ends? It ends in a mess. Then in the millennial kingdom, well, guess what happens? Here's Jesus Christ on the throne. Guess what happens? It ends in a mess. It doesn't get straightened out until Jesus Christ does away with man putting his hands on everything and saying, listen, y'all can't handle it no more. You better just give it to me and let me take it from here. But who wants to know about that stuff? You say, well, preacher, we really want you to preach about the book of Revelation and stuff like that. Well, that's easier said than stomached. Because you can't preach the, Revela the book of Revelation straight and preach it like these things that run around with lace on their britches and try to make it out to be something it's not. There's a time coming that's going to make Hitler look like a little schoolboy. There's a time coming where Jews are going to be, you think these people eating people's faces off and they're making a big ha-ha funny joke about that stuff. You, you think that stuff's a big joke, buddy? You wait until you find out in that book right there, cannibalism's running rampant and people are drinking blood and they're eating human beings. You wait until people are trying to die and they can't, jumping off of buildings and trying to kill themselves and they can't do that. You talk about zombies and all this and make a big joke about it. It ain't going to be a joking matter. I just thank God I ain't going to be here. 
But it's hard to preach about those events and not preach them like you believe them. I believe they're here. I believe in Revelation 9 when those demonic things come up out of the pit of hell. I believe they're literal devils that come up out of hell. I don't believe they're helicopters. I don't believe they're tanks. I don't believe they're spewing out gasoline. I don't believe they're shooting out rockets. I believe they're exactly what God says. I believe every book in the book of Revelation. And whether or not you understand this, that Bible is the easiest book there is in the book of Revelation to understand. It's just hard to believe. Because you can't believe that a loving God would turn over the entire creation to the devil and say, I've had it with you. I'm done. I'm going to take my bride out. Devil, you can do whatever you want to do. Turn to Zephaniah chapter number 3. I'll come back to this thing in Timothy in a second. Come on, preacher. Amen. Thank God. Zephaniah chapter number 3. That's in the Old Testament. Come on, preacher. The very, very difficult thing when you start going through this thing without seeing it from God's perspective. God sat up there and been quiet for 2,000 years. Might I even back up and say for 6,000 years. There's times where God should have stepped up and said, Man, I'm tired of you messing up everything I did. I sent you my only begotten son and you dirtied him up with your dirty, nasty, filthy hands and you rejected him after I gave the most precious thing I had. And I'm supposed to just sit up here and sit back and be a good God. I love you and everything's going to be great. No, sir, there's a time coming where God says, You know something? Y'all don't want me? Fine, I'm out of here. I'll let you fend for yourself. And that time's coming quick. You say, preacher, what do you think is going to happen? We're just going to walk through the book of Revelation and I'll show you from the Bible what it says. How long is it going to take? I don't know if you'll be around long enough to get it all. The Bible says in verse number 8, 3, 8, Zephaniah 3, 8. You got it? Amen. Notice the Bible says, Therefore wait ye upon me, saith the Lord, until the day that I rise up to what? It ain't P-R-A-Y. It's prey as in a lion that is fixing to overtake a lamb. It's prey as in a shark is fixing to grab up a seal. It is prey as in a wild animal, a wild beast that is fixing to destroy whatever he can get his hands on. That's the Lord. The Bible says this, For my determination is to gather the nations. What is that? Oh, I don't know. Maybe the United Nations? That's the nations that have got up there on the side of their building. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and all that stuff. And, and then they try to make it out to be like God's already done that. They're going to bring peace. You ain't going to bring peace until the king of peace is here. Amen. You can try to quote scripture all day long. God's not impressed with that anyway whatsoever. God says, I'll decide. You know what I've done? I've orchestrated. I'm sewing you all together with a big needle and thread. I'm pulling every one of you together for one reason. I'm going to get you in one place. So I can tear you to pieces. You say, I never heard of such fools in my life. You ain't read your Bible. You think all God is is a God of salvation. You better thank God you're saved by a God like this. And God says over there in the book of Deuteronomy, He says, as much as I rejoice over you to do you good, I rejoice on the day your calamity cometh upon you. The Bible says in Psalms chapter number 2, Psalms chapter number 5, and over there in Proverbs chapter number 1, He says, I'll laugh at you. I'll have you in derision that when your calamity cometh upon you and you'll cry out to me, but you've cried out to me in the past and I, you wouldn't listen to me when I talk to you, so I ain't going to listen to you when you come talk to me. He says, I'll laugh at you. I'll have you in derision. That's not just laughing. That's making fun of you. Amen. You say, well, I oh, don't believe in a God like that. Then you don't believe the God of the Bible. Amen. You better get on the right side of that thing. You better understand when you hit the judgment seat of Christ, you're dealing with a God that died for you, and there ain't going to be no games up there, and there ain't going to be no, well, I've just never seen you be like this. I've never seen this side of you. You better hide yourself from the wrath of the Lamb. You better hide yourself from the wrath of God. You better hide yourself from the wrath that He lets the devil have. You better get in Jesus Christ and thank God you're on that side, or you know what will happen to you? You will face the wrath of the Lamb. You will face the wrath of God, and you will face the wrath of the devil. Amen. Nobody wants to tell you that anymore nowadays. You say, why? It doesn't make you feel real positive. Does me? I'm on the right side. Amen. So you sound pretty arrogant. I got enough sense to know this. I'm not getting there by my own merit. I'm getting there because I trusted Jesus Christ. It's time some of you had some smelling salts jammed up your nose and you start to realize what God saved you from and you start to understand that if it wasn't for God Almighty, you'd be busting hell wide open and not only would you be here during the time of the tribulation, you'd be here in hell and then after that in the lake of fire forever. It's time to stop playing. God into right. this simple sort of a, well, fellas, what do y'all think about it? And God's up there saying, you didn't trust Jesus Christ? Go to hell. That's it. Yeah. That's right. That's right. He would never say that. 
Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Right. Tell me he don't say it. Right. Zephaniah chapter number 3, the Bible says this in verse number 8, Therefore wait upon me, saith the Lord, until the day I rise up to pray for my determination. My determination is to gather the nation that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Even all my fierce anger for all, for all, for all. Yes, right. The earth shall be devoured with the fire of my... <coughs> you mean the Lord's jealous? Yeah. It ain't right to be jealous. Tell him that. Come on, he said, I bought and paid. I got the title deed to this place called yes, earth. I paid for it with my blood. I sent down my perfect sacrifice. Yes, and it bothers me when you give yourself over to something I'm going to burn up. Yes. You know what? It's time you start realizing that that particular side is there. Isaiah chapter number 30. Right. Isaiah chapter number 30. You see, the reason most people want the book of Revelation taught is so that they have an answer when individuals come up there and they want to be able to answer all the deep things of God. Well, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. The deepest thing of God is is to understand that a God that's like that could have enough pity to send me a way out through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's pretty deep stuff. Yeah. But you know what, ladies and gentlemen? You're in the day of Laodicea. Amen. If I preach this on a Sunday morning, you wouldn't have half the crowd come back on Sunday night. Yeah. Have nobody talk to me like that. Okay. You'll see him when you get there. You know what that Bible says about him in Revelation? That when he spoke, John said, man, it's like listening and I ever falls, man. That, he was so loud, man. It was like the sound of many mighty rushing rivers. You know, it was like it was like thunder, man. I mean, it shook me on the very inside. I mean, just seeing him scared me so bad. I fell at his feet as if I were dead. It scared me to death. It stung me just to look at it. Right. And that's the one he loved. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. You know what he said? Man, it scared me to death. And you know what Christians do? I just can't believe a God would do something like that. You kids live like the cotton-picking devil. You know why? Yeah, God, God understands. We'll see if he understands. If he'll laugh at those individuals that have rejected him, what do you think he'll do to those that knew better? Oh my. I know this for me, and this is just a human side of something to understand. I know this for me. Well, my daddy would wear me out and whoop the tar out of me if I knew how better to do something and I didn't do it than if I did it out of ignorance. My daddy would wear me out if he said, boy, you knew better. My brother might not have known what I knew, and I got out and got in a mess. He said, y'all get the thing? Uh-uh. Y'all get the same thing? No, sir. He got away with different. You say, he still got a whooping. Yeah, but not like I got a whooping. Because he said, boy, you knew better. Amen. And some of you, bless God, know better. But now all of a sudden you've been listening to this pedal yeah, stuff anymore. Puke is a good word. And now you convince yourself, it don't matter. I got plenty of time. When I get old like the preacher. I'll straighten out and fly right. You better put the crack pipe down, buddy. You ain't going to make it to be old as a preacher is. Isaiah chapter 30. Hello, Jesus. How are you? Verse 28. The Bible says in verse number 28, And his breath as an overflowing stream shall reach to the midst of the neck to sift the nations with a sieve of vanity. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of people, causing them to err. You know what he says? Look in Isaiah chapter number 40. You know what he says? All these people put all this hope in the United Nations. You say you're anti-government. No, I'm not. I'm pro-Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm not anti-government at all. I can't be according to Romans chapter number 13. But I do know this. My hope is not in the government. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and His righteousness. I'm trusting the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm not trusting the government to get me out of the mess. I don't care who throws a nuclear bomb this direction. I don't care who threatens to invade the country. My kingdom is not of this world. I'm getting out of here. I'm not going to die trying to protect something that's going to burn. Not going to get all wrapped up. and They're going to take our rights. 
They can't take my salvation, bless God. That gives me a right to eternity. That gives me a right to a home in heaven. That gives me a right to be washed in the blood and to be free from sin. That gives me the right to a glorified body. That gives me a right to the mind of Christ. That gives me the keys and the glory. They can't take that away from me. What are you going to do about taxes? Pay them while I can. And then when I came, I guess they put me in jail. And I'll do the best I can. Isaiah chapter number 40. The Bible says this in verse number 15. Behold, the nations huh, are great and marvelous. Behold, the nations have all the answers and all of the powers that run them all. They're so smart and so big with all of their armies and their weapons and their nuclear abilities and their powers and their money. Oh, they're so great. We think they're so great, we even rate them. What nation is one and two and three and four? Oh, we're in the top ten nations. You know what God says about your nations? Get you a big old 40-gallon bucket and put a drop in there and y'all let you know what I think of your nation. You say, that's pretty sarcastic. You ain't read your Bible very much. God's pretty sarcastic a lot of times. He's downright smart about those kind of things. You say, why? Because those nations are built upon feet of clay. And they'll crumble. You say, why? Because they're built on man. They're not built on a solid foundation. Notice what he says, verse 15. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket. They are counted as small as dust of the balance. What? Let me give you this picture. If I had, can you, do you remember the, the, the balances? Do you remember the, the little things? Do you remember that? Excuse me if I get upset. I'm sorry if I'm offending you. Listen, you remember them little balance things? Stay with me. All right, here's what he's saying. There's dust on the balances. Do you pay any attention to that dust before you put the stuff in the balance? No, because it doesn't really affect the weight of the balance, right? Because dust doesn't weigh nothing. Now, with that in mind, and are counted as small as dust of the balance. That's what he says about our nations. Amen. They don't even affect how things are going to come out. Amen. They have no, uh, no effect on the outcome of things. They're, I'm not even going to recognize them to the point that I need to get a rag out and dust them because, hey, you know, they're weighing it one way or the other. They might sway it in one direction or another. The Lord says they're like the dust of the balance. You don't pay no attention to dust. You know why? It don't weigh nothing. Amen. That's what I think of your nation. You ready? Amen. That ain't just Muslims. Right. And it ain't just Catholics. Right. It's a so-called Christian nation, even the United States of America. You say what it is? We're in the all nations. Right. Amen. Oh, oh, well, oh, have you know. Hey, I'm red, white, and blue. Thank God for the freedom we got for a while. Appreciate it. Appreciate what we've lived and had and all that. Dog. I ain't wanting to move out. But God looks at it and says to you, I just want to let you know that you may be enjoying it, but it ain't nothing to me. How do you like how God's talking to you tonight? Yeah. About some of you got to get you a couple cups of coffee and wake up. As small as dust in the balance, behold, he taketh up the aisles a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. The, the, the nation of Lebanon is so, I ain't even going to set it on fire, it ain't even worth burning. Watch, nor the beast thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as Zippo, zero, the hole of a donut. That means nothing. So when you hear all this rhetoric going around nowadays about, I am the leader of the free country and the greatest nation upon the earth. <sighs> the Lord's like... Hey, Dave, come here a minute. Michael, just, did you leave? leave? Are you? I'm sorry, I'll get The greatest nation of all the earth. He ain't been reading his Bible, has he? You know what those individuals ought to be saying to you right now? 
they ought to be standing up here and saying, but by the grace of God, ladies and gentlemen, our nation would be in a cotton-picking mess if it wasn't for God blessing America and if it wasn't for God doing what's right. You know what, ladies and gentlemen, we'd be like any other third world country and I want to give glory where glory belongs because I realize our nation is nothing without God and we want to make sure, that, but they ain't going to tell you that. They're going to ride you like a rented mule and shoot you when they're done with you. Amen. You're scaring me. About time you got scared. Amen. You're living like the devil. About time you get straightened out. Amen. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him. Wow. Lord, I thought nothing was pretty definitive. Come on. Have you ever read this passage? Yes, I know if I ask you, you'll lie. How many of you have read that passage? Everybody here. Me, I read that. Amen. For sure, I read that. <laughs> if you read that right there, you know what I'd be willing to bet you? I'd be willing to bet you you wouldn't be living the way you're living. Go, brother. You'd be willing that you'd be understanding that how you vote ain't going to change the outcome of things. When God gets ready to put down a period, man ain't going to erase it and Preach say, let's put a colon, let's put a semicolon, let's put a hyphen, let's put a column. Hey, when God says I'm done, that means he is done. D-O-N-E, done. That's right. That's right. You know what he says? I just want to make sure you clearly understand when I say nothing, I mean less than nothing. Zippo. Yeah. See all this out of the book of Revelation? See, we ain't even gone one verse. I ain't even got started in the verse. You say, well, I, 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 don't, I don't, my, 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 my goodness, preacher, is there more? Yeah, there is. Jeremiah chapter 30. There's a whole lot more. Did you ever look at what he did to the nation of Israel? Did you ever look at what he did to the nation of Israel? Did you ever realize the nation of Israel wound up on a regular basis? that the nation of Israel wind up being persecuted and imprisoned and killed and destroyed in Titus, by Titus in, 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 in 70 A.D. And then later on, the Bible says in Matthew 27, when they stood up and crucified the Lord of glory, you know what he says? Let his blood be upon us and upon our children's children. Oh, okay, big shot. You sound like an independent Baptist shooting your mouth off. Oh, yeah, we can handle the heat upon your children's children. Guess what happened? How about 15 million of them put in ovens and hung up on telephone wires and took out and laid out upon rocks and having their guts stripped out, having their babies thrown up in the air and caught on bayonets, having babies held by the legs and having their brains bashed out while their mamas were being raped and their daddy's eyes were gouged out. His blood be upon us. And Did you ever look at what he did to the nation of Israel? What do you think he'll do to a Gentile nation? that has rejected him yeah. in the age of grace yes. Yes. had the benefit of Calvary. Yes, sir. What do you think he'll do then? Well, preacher, I mean, you know. Yeah, I know. I know the Laodicean attitude about this. Right. The Bible says, I would that thou wert either hot yeah. or cold. Yeah. I would you were one or the other. Get off the cotton picking fence. You say, why? Because lukewarm makes me sick. I'll spew Amen. you out. Makes me nauseated. Modern day Christian. Trying to make God into something. I know why you do it. I'm going to be real straight with you. They will fire you. Okay, I'll go out screaming. But listen to me. I know why you do it. Because you're living like the devil. That's why you're doing it. You're trying to make God into what God understands. No, he don't. He died for your sin. Don't ever take that as understanding. Understand he hates sin. And he hates it to the point that he's willing to let his son die. But trust me when I tell you, if you've rejected his son, I'll guarantee you the wrath that he has against sin will be poured out on you. Well, my goodness, what do you think hell's all about? Jeremiah chapter number 30. Verse number 11. The Bible says, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a, are you with me? Yes, Brother Jerry, what's the word? Full, Full right? Full. Mama, what's the word? Full end. Full end, Full end of how many nations? Oh. No, not the United States of America. We're coming out of the recession. Oh, we're getting better, and things are going to be better. And hey, housing is going to go up, and jobs are going to go up. We're going to resolve the problems in America. You might resolve the problem, but you ain't going to never fix that one. Amen. 
I will make a full end of all nations. Get it out of your mind now as we study the book of Revelation. The United States of America ain't going to be here in the end. Amen. A full end of how many nations? Oh. Every one of them. Including your nation. Where's your fire at, preachers? You're supposed to be telling people, hey, yes, sir. while everybody else is saying how positive it is and how good it is and let's erect the right people, you're supposed to be saying, God says go make a full end. You better get ready for the end. Right. But you won't be real popular doing that. Right. Can't build up much of a congregation doing that. And you say, why? It don't matter. People don't like the truth. They don't want to face what the truth is. I'd just rather believe what I've always believed than to hear what the Bible says. Verse number 11, For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee, though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. Who's he talking to? Who? Jews. The Jews. Don't be bashful. He says, Everywhere a Jew has been, I'm going to make a full end of every place that the heel of that foot touched. The soul of that Jew has been in the United States of America. It's been in every nation on the earth, just to let you know. But let's not concern ourselves as we usually do with everybody else. The Jew has been to this nation. I will make a full end of every place I, I, the Lord, scattered them. Hitler didn't scatter them. Stalin didn't scatter them. The Lord scattered them. And who would have ever thought that his scattering of them would have wound up being a curse to us? God said, I'll make a full end of every place you've ever been, every shore you've ever touched. But I'm not going to make a full end of thee. But going to come pretty close to it. I'll keep about 3,000 of you over there in the Red Rock City of Petra. But the whole nation of Israel is going to be turned over one day to the Gentiles during the Great Tribulation and they're going to corrupt everything they put their hands on and it's going to be trodden underfoot for 42 months. Preacher, you know Israel's never going to be defeated again. What Bible are you reading? You better stick with Israel, but the time's coming during the Great Tribulation where Israel's going to fling her last rocket and God's going to say, hey, you know what? Y'all better get out of the city. You better get away because I'm going to let the Gentile have it one more time before I come in and clean house. By the way, any country, any nation that turns against that nation, you're just making it doubly hard on yourself. But I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure. And will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Now, I want you to understand something. We still got a little bit of time. When it starts talking about these things, it's important for you to understand the church age doesn't end that way. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. <clears throat> Revelation is not about the church. Did you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. But it should stir you up. You say, why? When we get into the book of tribulation, or the book of Revelation, and you start seeing the things going on, yeah. you know what you'll be thinking? You'll be having pity on anybody left here in that time. Yeah. And then they step right out of that mess and step right into hell. And they stay in hell for a thousand and seven years or a thousand and forty two months or for a thousand years if they die right at the end of the thing. But however long they're down there, they're down there for at least a thousand years during the millennial kingdom and they're burning and suffering in torment. You say, preacher, I, people don't preach about hell no more. Well, that's their fault. Yeah. You cannot preach about it. You know why they don't preach about it? Because they're trying to air condition. They're planning on moving in, I guess. Let, let, me, let, me, let me explain something to you, ladies and gentlemen. Any preacher won't tell you about hell don't love you at all. You know what? He's more worried about what you think about him than he is about your soul. Going somewhere. You better get away from somebody like that. So, well, it's, just, it's not a popular doctrine. Who cares if it's popular if it saves you? We stood out there on the bridge one time tried to tell people, the bridge is out, bridge is out, bridge is out. Man, man, man. Fling us off and all that. Splashing water. Died. I'm sorry, it's my fault. No, it ain't. I told you the bridge was out stupid. 
You think you're going to blame God when you get there? The Bible says hell's prepared for the devil and his angels. That's the Lord speaking. If you got a red Bible, one of the words of Christ in red, that's the Lord saying where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. That's the Lord saying that when you get out there into hell, that if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, you know what he said? I prepared that for the devil and his angels. You find yourself there because you chose to go there, not because he chose to put you there. But you better make sure and mark her down right now, buddy. If you got out, it's by the grace of God you got out because you trusted his Savior to save you. You better clearly understand that. You better clearly understand it wasn't by your works or by your righteousness. You better understand it was a gift of God that he gave you the ability to get out of that place. But mark her down and make no mistake about it. If you reject him, he will not blink or shed a tear for putting you into hell. It won't bother him one bit, you say. I just don't understand that. It's because you ain't holy. That's why. Yeah. Say, well, that's just masochistic. You've been corrupted by Freud and by Young and by all the psychological slop you've been hearing coming out of the pulpit. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's biblically correct. Yes, right. but what does it do for my finances and my marriage? Make you stop your tomfoolery yes, and start living for something that matters. Right. Amen. Live for yourself. Right. Rich, you're getting old, you're having a heart attack. At least I know where I'm going to you. First Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. Huh. There's another mystery. They never saw this in the Old Testament. You say, why? Because the church wasn't mentioned in the Old Testament. You're getting a mystery that's written just for the church. God did something just for you. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, die, be dead, but we shall all be changed. In the twinkling, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. You know what he says? There's something different at the end of ours than there is at the end of the tribulation. Amen. Our age ends differently if you're saved. You get raptured. Or you die in Christ. First Thessalonians chapter number 4. Stop off at, uh, go to 1 Timothy 3 first. And you're supposed to in Philippians chapter number 3, it says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Right? Amen. Waiting for their calling on high. Well, who's he talking about? Calling, that means he's calling us up to him. You understand? In 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, I'll get to Timothy here in just a second. I believe he says of this. He says, uh, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. For the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Don't you tell me that the church age is the same as any other age, and don't you tell me that I'm going into the tribulation. You say, why? I am not, 1 Thessalonians 5, appointed unto wrath. Amen. Well, I just believe you are educated out of your own common sense. Right. That's right. We're going to study the book of Revelation. I hate to tell you, I am dogmatic when I come to the doctrine in the book of Revelation. Amen. I don't back up and say, well, now, that's pretty good conjecture there, brother. I'd have to think on that a while. Uh-uh. You ain't going through the tribulation. You want to believe that you are and be in misery and then spend all your time trying to prove to everybody you are. Help yourself. I'll not be derailed by it. I tell people what's going to happen to the tribulation to try to scare the blessings out of them. That's the only word I could think of that would fit. It's serious stuff. The book of Revelation is not a book to be grabbed and conjectured upon and pondered upon and think about. It's easy. Get saved and you ain't got to go through it. Amen. That's right. Amen. That's right. That's right. Then the things you don't understand that are going on in it, the Lord will open up the window and say, there it is right there, see? Okay, that's enough. Come on up here. I said, well, Lord, I, I just always believed we were going to go through that. You want to go down and join them? Okay, then. Don't be thinking that no more. You know what? This is going to sound arrogant, but I'm going to say it anyway. You've got to be completely stupid to believe something like that. 
You say, why? You have to ignore so many scriptures right. in that Bible, Amen. and you have to make them try to fit what you really want to believe. Why would you want to believe you're going to go through that mess anyhow? Amen. If God says you're going to get out, it's kind of like it's kind of like they open up the door and say, you can get out of jail. Oh, no. Uh, no. What? what? No, go ahead. You're out. You're free. Somebody paid your bond. You're free to go. Uh, I, I don't believe that. Yeah, here's the receipt, man. The bond's been paid. You're free. Go. I, I, I don't. We're going through the tribulation. No, you've been bought and paid for. You're going out. No, I don't believe that. I just believe we're going to get it in the neck. And, oh, it's going to be bad. And the devil's coming any day now. And we're all going to take the mark. And everybody get your guns and hide your money. Oh, get your food. We're going to die. <laughs> and the Lord's like, wow, the gate's open. Why don't you just yeah. walk out? Amen. <laughs> I can see some of you now. I'm telling you, I can see the Lord coming down there. And he says, hey, Michael. Yes, sir, Lord. You ready to shout? Yeah, Gabriel. You ready to blow? I'm ready. The Lord, he says, blow. Doo -doo. And Michael shouts because he's getting ready to resurrect Israel and that kind of thing. And the Lord says to you, come up here. Though. Oh, no, I, uh, no, no, I can't. I'm going through the tribulation. The Lord said, you're going to keep on messing around. I'm going to put you in the tribulation. You better come up hither. Oh, Lord, I just don't believe you intended for me to be saved from that. I just don't believe. I didn't know the Bible says, I wrote it, stupid. Come up hither. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Some of you are bound and determined not to accept that God's goodness and God's grace, based on the authority of the Bible, says you're going out. Amen. Well, I just believe. Well, go ahead and believe it. And boy, are you going to be miserable That's when right. the horn blows and the shout comes and you're going up through there and somebody comes up and goes, hey, brother, how you doing now? We got out of the tribulation. What do you think? You're going to go up there and like, man, Lord, why'd you do that? Why'd you try to convince people they were going to go through it? Well, I've been reading the Bible. Sometimes you can study the Bible till you get ignorant. Sometimes you get to reading the Bible, you go, for God so loved the world. Well, the world means only the ones that select it. The Lord said, I didn't say elected, I said the world. Run every cross reference to the world, there ain't never a word about elected. But I just believe he meant elected when he said world. Because he only loved the elected part of the world. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Well, now, what I really think he's saying there is you can get to that point where you get so corrupted, you know what can happen to you? You can get dumb, plumb stupid. Right. Amen. Why? I'm corrupted by how I think instead of what he says. Right. Yes, sir. Right. You come to that blessed book, you must understand. You come to it in the epitome of ignorance and you say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. Amen. And if you don't show me, I won't get it. And Lord, if you show me I'm wrong, I'll admit I'm wrong. Show me. Amen. The Lord Amen. says, I'm going to come get you out. And you say, Woo! Why do you believe that? Because God said it. Amen. Not God said it. I believe it. That settles it. You're an idiot. That makes you the authority. I said what I meant. My wife would be like, honey, you've got to stop saying idiot. I'm preaching right now. Right now I ain't married, amen. Right now I got no friends and I got no foes and I got no family. You say, what are you doing? I'm preaching right now. About time we had a little bit of preaching in there. Wake some of you dead heads up. Get you up out of the grave before yes, God calls you. And you miss the call because you're walking around with your fingers in your ears. That's right. Where are we at? 1 Timothy 3. Amen. The Bible says this, and without controversy, what? Without controversy, it's definitive. Ain't no question about it. It's not, Brother Kim, controversial. Not open for conversing. Did you get that? Ain't no conversation about it. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. There's another one of them mysteries. What is that? God manifest in the flesh. They didn't get that in the Old Testament. Who got that? Paul. 
God is embodied in the flesh. Why did he do that? Well, let's look a little further. Justify the spirit seat of angels. Preach to the Gentiles. Ah, there we are. Believed on in the world and received up in the glory. You know what? We're waiting to be received up in the glory. We're not going to go through the tribulation period. You want to convince yourself you are, by the time we're done with the book of Revelation, you're going to have to solve some things yourself. Philippians chapter 3, I think I gave this, but I want you to see it in the Bible. The church goes out before, before the tribulation. Revelation 1, Revelation 2, Revelation 3. To the church, 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 to the church. Seven of them. Revelation chapter number four. The apostle John says, I was caught up to heaven. There was a door opened. What happens? Well, now Revelation gets cranked up. Now you have the trumpets, the bowls, the vials, the seals, and all the other things that take place. You say, why does he do that? John's a type of the church. You have to be an imbecile to miss that. You say, you're making fun of me. I'm sorry if I offended you, but it's time you get your eyes off of the television and your nose out of the cotton right. ticket right. newspaper and quit worrying about all the politicians and all the stuff that's happened in the United States and what's going to happen to the next bank that's going to shut down and get yourself down on your knees and get them cotton picking calluses off of your soul and press your nose between the pages of that precious book and get your eyes on the author and finisher of your faith. Amen. Tired of modern day theology trying to put a bit and a bridle on me and saying, well, now hold on there, preacher, just a second. Modern day social gospel. Everybody's all right. They're the devil. The Holy Spirit don't tell you everything's all right. If you're doing wrong, does he? It ain't the preacher doing that. Preacher can get up there and say, Woo, heaven's good. And you're like, Oh, man, I feel terrible. Why is that? Holy Spirit says, You're wicked. You ain't going to fit up here. Amen. You know what you need? You need a shower. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're dirty. Right. You stink. Yes, sir. You're right. You're filthy. You're right. What do I do? You need a bath. Why? What do I take it in? The blood. Amen. Ooh, I don't want to get in that. Then go to hell. I'm not cussing. Didn't he tell you? It's okay, fine. You don't want to come to heaven? You make your choice. I'm not going to force it on you. Right. Listen, what we're going to cover in the next period of time, it don't take a whole lot of intellect. If I can get it, anybody can get it. You know what it takes? It don't take a lot of understanding. It takes a lot of belief. God said it. Okay. I believe it. What do you think about that? He didn't ask me my opinion. He just said it's going to happen. Philippians chapter number 3. Man, it's late already. Philippians chapter 3, verse number oh, 20. For our conversation is in where? From whence also... What's that say? We look. He's making a pretty big assumption there, ain't he? Are you looking up tonight? Are you looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? And how come you're humped over and got your head down and saying, Woe is me, and my husband is me, and my wife is me, and my children are Danny and the devil, and my business is going under, and nobody loves me, and everybody hates me. I'm going to go eat worms, little bitty skinny ones, and big old fat ones. Everything's terrible. Everything's bad. Everything hurts. What you looking at? We're doomed. We're doomed. The stock market crash. Don't bother me. I ain't got nothing in it, amen. If peanut butter goes under, we're in trouble then. That's the tribulation. Amen. Ain't that right? The economy's going under. Where's the peanut butter? 
Amen. Peanut butter is good on anything. Anything. Squash, peanut butter. Yo, it's good. You just got to put enough on it to make sure you don't taste the squash. And think it's bread. It's bread. It's bread. Manna from heaven. Where are you looking tonight? But once we look for who? The Savior. Thank you, sister. The Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Let's see what he says about us. I like when he talks about us, don't you? Amen. Who shall change our world? Oh, help me, Jesus. Can I get a witness? Change our what? 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 That's what he says about our body. You say, why? A friend of mine's daddy whose vile body is trying to give up in Missouri. Friend of mine, sister, ran in the hospital, whose vile body is trying to give up. They're getting a little better, but that does not change that our bodies are vile. The Bible says this. He said it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. So he changes our vile body, gives us a body like his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue, even to subdue all things unto himself. You know what I'm trying to get across to you? Look in Philippians 3. Again, verse number 14. Philippians 3, verse number 14. You know what I'm trying to get across to you? I'm trying to get across to you that your hope is not down here. If you're going to understand the book of Revelation, you need to clearly understand before we can even plow the first verse that book ain't to you. Because you ain't going to be here. Amen. Philippians chapter number 3, verse 13. I'm sorry. The Bible says this, brethren. I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the high calling, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us therefore... As many be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. You know what he's saying to you? You get your eyes off of Jesus. If you really want to know, he'll show you your eyes are in the wrong place. You say, how does he do that? Through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will tell you something long before the preacher tells you. He's already told you. You just hate it when the preacher confirms it. Can you stay with me for just a second or two more? Let me give you just a couple more things here. Look in Matthew chapter number 22. Matthew chapter number 22. I'll give you these references as you're turning there. In Matthew, there's 92 references to Old Testament. That's the most of all the Gospels. Hebrews is written. The Hebrews comes with 102 references. Both books are strongly and predominantly Jewish in character. You turn to the book of Revelation, there's no less than 200 and 85 references to the Old Testament. That's three times more than any other book. You say, why is that? Because in the book of Revelation, you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to set something up for you. He's trying to explain something to you. I guess before I get into this thing, because this thing will run about 30 minutes, I guess I will break it off and I'll pick it up in Sunday school. But let me say this to you. I didn't realize it's 10 after 8. Well, let, me, let me explain something to you. I'll be more than happy to preach and teach the book of Revelation. But you have to take that book of Revelation and realize while we learn some things about it, all it should do is make us long to be there even more. Amen. It shouldn't make us all of a sudden go... Yeah. And the next thing you know, you're walking around going to the hat store trying to buy a hat because your head's done grown two sizes too big. Learning about the book of Revelation is not to increase knowledge, for with the increase of knowledge cometh much sorrow. Amen. Knowledge puffeth up. Right. It's getting the knowledge and then grabbing the understanding of how does that apply to me and my relationship to God and how does that make me a better Christian. And let me just caution you, for those of you who haven't been through the book of Revelation, you ain't going to have no excuse to judge and see to Christ after you read what's going to happen to those left behind. God's going to say, you knew all that, what'd you do? And how'd you continue to live? 
That's why as we progress in this book, you know what will happen? You'll start seeing things thin down a little bit. You say, why? Because if there's any other book in that Bible, I don't know it, that will call you to a meeting with God, it's that book. After you're saved. You say, well, it will make you forget all about what's going on down here. You say, what happens, buddy? John gets called up to the third heaven, and from Revelation chapter number four, you see things as God sees things. And your perspective has to change, and it can no longer be me looking up at God. won't ever be anymore. God, it's all about me. And you start reading Revelation. It's all about him. It's his perspective. It'll change your life. But you've got to be willing to stick with it. A long, slow study. But it'll change your spiritual life and help you to view things from God's perspective. I'll say this when I'm done. In Deuteronomy 32, you don't have to turn there. Just listen. Moses gets caught up. Pisgah. He's dying now. The Bible says his natural force was not abated. His eye wasn't dim. In other words, he didn't die of old age. God killed him because he struck the rock twice. He says, Moses, look out yonder. He said, what do you see? He said, Lord, I've never seen the land of Canaan before. He said, what do you see out there? He said, oh, man. He said, that's the land of milk and honey, Lord. He said, what happened, Moses? He said, Lord, I couldn't see it from where I was. But you know what happens when I get up here where you are? Oh my goodness, I can see things entirely differently than I could when I was down there at the bottom of the mountain. You know what's going to happen when we go to the book of Revelation? You're going to start looking at things from up there. And you're going to sit there and go, my goodness, man. You mean God's going to do all that stuff? And then you're going to look in the mirror and say, He's going to do all that to them, and he did all this for me. Yeah. You know what it'll do? It'll knock all of us off our high horse. Yeah. And it'll help us to realize we wouldn't have that vision if it wasn't for God saying, come up with it. Yeah. Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed. God bless you for coming tonight. I'm glad you're here. I'd appreciate it if you'd pray for me. And I'll pray for you and let's pray for our church. Amen. That God will take this study and really do something for us. I mean, really help not just get a whole bunch of technical things, but I mean, really minister to us spiritually as we go through these things. Help it to secure our faith, to anchor us, as y'all sang about tonight, so that when trouble comes and trials come, we don't get blown around with every wind of doctrine. Oh, Sam, you just miss us in prayer, will you please? God, thank you so much for giving us a, a place to come here to worship, God. Thank you so much that it's still a place we can come and hear your words preach the way they're supposed to be preached, God. We don't have to you know, put up with all the foolishness out there, God. I pray that you please help us, God. Help us not to push away from it, Lord. Help us to, to, to listen to it, to hear it, help us to open our hearts to it, God. God, I pray as we go through this study, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will teach us and to, to guide us, Lord, and that we get to preach it exactly what we have to preach, Lord. All right. God bless you. See you Sunday morning.